um, the next speaker I'm uh, delighted could come is Yujit Demirel. He's come to us from University of Strathclyde, all the way from Glasgow. Do you think I could have been a very successful Olympic swimmer if I had all the necessary skills and if I trained every day? Well, the answer is no. Even if I had all the necessary skills and I did everything, my, my lovely beard would slow me down. So I would be less efficient. And in Oly Olympic Games, milliseconds are important. So I would never become a very successful swimmer. And ships are no different than us. Ships are the same. If ships have fouling, AKA beard, on the hull, basically this fouling would slow them down and they would become inefficient. So this is the main idea. So today, hopefully, I will try and talk you through the effect of biofouling on ship energy efficiency and performance. And I find it actually very useful because I often get to speak to hydrodynamicists, engineers, or academics, and, you know, we just applause each other, and that's it. But I find this very valuable that I could speak to you, to the marine regulatory people, to uh, biologists, to scientists, so that we can have a basic understanding. Even I find it useful to talk to ship owners because I understand it differently and they look at it from a different point of view. All right, so the basics. Why I'm interested in fouling as a naval architect or engineer, my colleague just set the scene. Fouling means roughness. Slime, muscles, barnacles, all of them I see as a roughness, nothing else. Okay, they have different roughness. Slime has, has less than barnacle, but at the end of the day, they are all roughness. What happens if we have a rough surface? We have an increase in resistance. And resistance is actually easy to explain. Action, reaction. I am trying to propel the ship to go from A to B, and the, sh the C is trying to stop the ship. If I can overcome the resistance, basically my ship moves. So if this resistance is increasing, it means that I have to burn more fuel, and it means I need to spend more money. This is very important. The ship owners are really interested in the money. I am very interested in the energy efficiency. But the thing is, we don't necessarily know how much. So to what extent? How we can quantify it? So I'll talk about this later. And obviously, lately, it means increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Well, it's lately because we didn't really think about it earlier. So from an engineer point of view, to avoid this falling, the best way is to kill them, and there is no problem. So we were quite happy back then, you know, when we were using TBT, we thought that it's over, it's now yesterday's problem, so happily ever after. Having said that, now obviously other guys realize that these chemicals are very toxic to environment, and they may end up affecting the non-target species, including humans, so they are also having negative effects on environment. So it's like two sides of the medallion. So now we are trying to find a compromise between those, the, these two different uh, views. Okay, when we first start, what we can do? We can use marine coatings. And what I did is I look at the marine coating companies' brochures or websites and etc. With all due respect, I see many different numbers, 10%, 7%, and even sometimes very precise number, 13.5 and etc. But I couldn't find the scientific background. So I said, okay, I'm an academic, so I better look at literature and academia, what my colleagues did. So what I found is turbulent boundary layer or skin friction of lab scale plates. So these are very important uh, information for an hydrodynamicist. And you know, without this data, I cannot do anything. However, this information alone is not 
enough for these two guys. You know, the engineer who is in the shipyard or design office and the ship owner. They don't understand anything looking at this literature. So there is a gap here. So the gap is how might the roughness of coatings and biofouling be related to full scale? So there are not much tools and there is not a clear path to find this. So what happens? This guy who would choose the coating basically will be in somewhere else in five years time. So does he really care about what happens in five years time or the life cycle of the ship? Not really. So he would go and choose the less risky coating. Probably he heard it from the previous engineer. So that's all. Or he has a good friend from coating company A. So he bought it from there. So that's, that's all happens. OK, so what we are doing is conventionally naval architects, we sign a contract with the ship owner and we say, we will reach to this speed with that power. So that black curve is called ship trial or sea trial. When you build the ship, you first try it in calm water, amazing surface, and then you get this curve. So speed versus power. And this is what we had to do in the contract it says. And very roughly, we used to put 10%, 15% C margin, we call it C margin, to account for everything. So waves, wind, drift, or fouling. For everything, we used to put margins. Well, at the moment, we don't have this luxury. So IMO is not only talking about invasive species, but they are now talking about greenhouse gas emissions. So by 2050, we have very ambitious uh, aims. So we cannot anymore just put a 10% or 15% C margin. But we need to really try and find or predict what's happening to the foul foul. So basically, we have a new curve. What will happen if I have to have the same speed? I would either increase my uh, power, which means I need to spend more money and I need to emit more greenhouse gas emissions. Or if I don't want to do that, I have to reduce my speed, which means I am late, so I'm losing money again. So a diagnosis is important. So this is the velocity profile in a smooth surface. So luckily, we engineers know that if we have a smooth surface, we know what's happening on the turbulent boundary layer. But when we have roughness, basically this turbulent boundary layer is changing, the velocity profile is changing, and every single roughness has different effect. This delta U plus, called roughness function, velocity loss uh, profile, uh, sorry, velocity loss function, you, you, you probably heard before, so they are different for every single surface and every sing single configuration. So 10% slime, 20% slime, they have different delta U plus. And if I know this, actually I can predict. And it is a simple term in the equation. So if I see any fouling, the only thing I can imagine is this delta U plus, nothing else. So we came up with a methodology it's nothing totally complete and nor perfect, but this is our view. So at the end, by using all the information and the tools that we are developing, we are trying to find a, some sort of decision-making uh, procedure, which means by using this, you can maybe try and choose a good coating or a maintenance uh, schedule or dry dock schedule or underwater hull cleaning and et cetera. So for this, we need some information. What we need, first of all, we need the roughness. And we need to do experiments. Because remember, all the surfaces means delta U plus for me. So I need to get this delta U plus. How? I can carry out experiments. And if I can carry out experiments, then I would find my delta U plus values. Next step would be to use 
turbulent boundary layer equations, okay, they have some assumptions, but they can still give me some prediction. Or I can use my CFD tools, which are very highly sophisticated. So by using these two different tools, I can have the roughness effect on ship resistance and powering. And if I keep doing this for a range of speed, for a range of ships, for a range of fouling conditions, it will give me an edit resistance database, a big cloud. And by using this and combining them with all the other information coming from the ships, we can try and find what's happening in time. So we can create some scenarios. How do I carry out these experiments? So there are many different ways. What I have is fully turbulent flow channel. We recently established this. It is a unique uh, facility. So we improved the existing facilities from other universities and we came up with this. So basically you can put any surface in this uh, facility uh, and you can reach up to 15 meter per second. And by measuring the pressure drop or by using PIV, you can find your roughness function. Another method, towing tank. So by using towing tank and some flat plates, you can tow them in a channel and then you can find your uh, roughness functions. So this is one example of what I did. So I take a big flat plate of 1.5 meter, I applied some coatings and I did some 3D scanning. I went to the dry docks and I scanned the surfaces. In this study, I was trying to look at the barnacle surfaces. So we then by using 3D printing, we basically glue these 3D uh, printed barnacles to the flat plate and then we tow them. So for those of you who never seen a towing test, it's like basically a long channel and then you tow whatever you have. It can be a flat plate, it can be a ship, it can be a submarine and you get the resistance. Remember, resistance is the force that the water is trying to apply to us to, to stop us. So here, as you can see, you know, just this is just an indication, a smooth surface, we have around 40 Newton. If we have 20% uh, coverage, we are at around 90 Newton. So it's more than two times. We cannot say that, okay, if it's the case, it's the case for the ship because everything is different. Well, in the meanwhile, obviously I'm an academic and I have to verify and validate what I'm doing. So this is a kind of a fundamental study uh, to see and assess whether my tools are working properly. We carry out some fundamental studies. So this is a flat plate, smooth one. This is a flat plate covered with a very well-known sand grain. And the same thing with a container ship model, smooth and covered with the uh, sand. Uh, grid. So by carrying out these two experiments, actually we were able to verify and validate our approach. Which approach? First one is the 2D flat plate approach using boundary layer equations. And secondly, the CFD approach. And as far as I'm concerned, these are the very first attempts to validate these two approaches. Okay, so this was just a bit of talk about these two. So now about CFD, well, CFD is computational fluid dynamics. I'm not going to give more details, but it's a highly sophisticated uh, method that you are trying to solve uh, Navier-Stokes equations by using different approaches. The first step was obviously I try and uh, simulate my flat plates. And the second step, I try and use it for ships, ship without any propeller. So I did it for model scale first, and then I did it for full scale. And using this software, actually, this method, you can see all the small information, all the details that you need to interpret what's happening if you have fouling on your ship hull. So just some examples. So for one case, 
So this is a big barnacles and 20% of the ship is covered with these barnacles. So you would have a 60% increase in effective power. So the resistance that the water is applying to the ship is 60% more. It's a huge number if you think about the fuel consumption. Some other results, uh, so to be more um, realistic, we can look at the heavy slime. If we had, had heavy slime, it means that we would have 40% increase in the effective power. And if we have a heavy calcareous fouling, which you cannot really see it, I mean, you shouldn't really let your ship to be in that situation. Well, if you had done this, so you, you would have 130% increase in effective power. So believe me, these numbers, the ship owners would not believe these numbers because the, the sea is a very chaotic environment. You have a lot of uncertainties. You have you know, wind, wave. Uh, you have some people that you are relying on. So you know, under all these uncertainties, you just put everything under sea margin. So it's not, not very easy to realize which is coming from which. And next obvious step for me was to try this method on propellers. Again, I started with model scale, and then I tried uh, full scale in different uh, conditions. And again, here to summarize, we see up to 19% efficiency loss on a propeller. Well, in this case, the propeller is in open water conditions. Next step is now together. I have a ship and I have a propeller, the real case. Because when you have a propeller behind the ship, it's a totally new scenario. And there's a lot of uh, things, unsteady things happening. And here we had a lot of different scenarios. Let's say fault hull, clean propeller, clean, pro uh, clean uh, hull, fault propeller. So this gave us some indications about which is more important or uh, to what extent I need to take some uh, precautions to avoid this. And again, if we look at some results, if I have small barnacles, 10% of the hull, it means I would have a 23% increase in required shaft power. So here I started talking about shaft power because I'm not to, I don't have to talk about resistance because now I have a rotating propeller and I can basically measure the, the power needed to rotate the shaft. So another method Okay, CFD is very computationally expensive. We are talking about days and months and big supercomputers. But if we use 2D flood plate method, as I said, to a certain degree, we can find some accurate results. So what I have done, I said, I mean, okay, it's easy, but it's easy for me. It's not an easy method for ship owner or engineer. So I said, rather than explaining the methodology, I could try and create some diagrams, like Moody diagrams, but rather than giving them the methodology, a, an engineer or ship owner can go and choose their ship length. So every single curve is a ship length, and all of the figures are representing a condition, a falling condition. Then you know your speed, okay, 20 knots. So basically it would give you the non-dimensionalized increase in the resistance. So if you simply use these diagrams, it would more or less give you uh, a, a good prediction. So this is another study. Well, it, the, at the end, this is the, this is the dream model in our mind. So we keep carrying out theoretical and numerical studies. We keep carrying out experimental studies. We get new noon data every day. We are trying to carry out immersion tests and dry dock reports, and we are trying to put all of them together to come up with a life cycle assessment. Because it's not that easy. You put a coating A, and what's happening? You can only understand what's happening with a life cycle approach. You cannot look at now, and then you cannot understand what's happening in five years' time. And for the user, 
we again uh, dream of such a model. The user would only put the ship type, ship speed, operational conditions and locations, and then they would have some decision making at the end, some coating type, maintaining strategies, costs, and et cetera. While talking about life cycle assessment, I'm wrapping up it up. Uh, we are talking about all different stages from production to application and to the end of life. And in this model, we are taking into account every single stage, paint application, uh, dry dock, and obviously the ship in the operational conditions. Just an example, we took a buff carrier. Uh, we have three different operational conditions, same coating. Obviously, different operations have different idle days, and the results are significantly different. So you have 37% increase, 86% increase, and 20% increase in resistance, depending on your operational profile. And obviously, we can translate them into some big money or some big greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, it is not as simple as it looks for us. And if you ask me, a holistic approach is needed, so we need to work together. You and the engineers, we need to work together. Ship operating profile and ship route are significant parameters that you know needs to be taken into account before selecting a coating. And for us, the real impact of a coating can only be assessed through a life cycle assessment. And this approach may be used to decide the best maintenance or hull cleaning activities because you can then understand whether which one is better to go and have a hull cleaning or to keep going for another six months. And more input means more accurate results. Let's work together. Thank you very much. <laughs>